my father's sister was Auntie Regina, who was the matriarch of the Sagan family. Her kids were Essie, that's Esther, uh, Becky, who was Rebecca, and Eric. Did you experience in Bombay any anti-Semitism at all? Not at all. We didn't know what it was. <laughs> we didn't know, know what anti-Semitism was. Mm. And they all loved us because we were fair. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Mm. And they respected us because of our colour. If you wanted to be educated in English, and the Jews wanted to be educated in English, um, you had to go to a Christian school either a Christian missionary school or a church school. We went to a cathedral school, which was attached to the local cathedral. And even the school teachers, you know, I, uh, the school teacher would refer to me as Shylock. But always the Christians, the Hindus had no truck with us. Muslims had no truck with us. And uh, we got on very well. When I came to England, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, my husband's brother said, don't ever say you're Jewish. Hmm. Why? We, we, we were not suppressed or anything over there, so we didn't understand. That's funny, I never knew he said, I didn't realize that Albert said, don't told, tell anybody you're Jewish. Jewish. Nobody yeah. knows we are Jewish. He, to, he told Oliver not to say at school. Really? Yeah, yeah. yeah but I used words around saying, I'm a Jew! <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, I knew some Indian Jews in Golders Green, where I was brought up, and uh, they always seemed a little bit different uh, to us. We were Ashkenazi Western Jews. At the time, it seemed so exotic and so beautiful. So uh, I got hooked on Indian Jews and uh, discovered that there were several types of Indian Jews. There were the um, Jews that today I call Baghdadi Jews, um, who were the majority in the Jewish area of Golders Green in London. Um, but there were also Bene Israel, um, who came from Maharashtra, Bombay area. And there were also Cochin Jews. And um, this became the love of my life. I've been studying uh, Indian Jews since 1971. Come, Come on, do me a favor. This one and Saba had it framed. This is a sunset. I love this cat. I love the expression on his face. And I worked so hard to get that expression. And when my grandchildren come here, I said, you can take any picture you like. My relationship with my mother was good because she would work to give us everything we wanted. My relationship with my father, he was always domineering, wanting you to improve yourself in every way, never ever sort of a praise or something like that from him, although my sister knew how to handle him. She knew how to take my father and she got anything she wanted out of him. But I was the opposite in character. I was... I was not a nice person. If I wanted something, I asked for it. But not in a nice way. And of course, you didn't get it. The largest group of Indian Jews are the Bene Israel, children of Israel, Bene Israel. They call themselves Bene Israel, but it's Bene Israel, the children of Israel. And they have a wonderful Indian type of legend to show how they came to India um, in a boat. 
and there, this was at the time of 175 BCE, the time of Antiochus coming into Jerusalem and about to invade and persecute the Jews. And these people, probably the tribe of Zavulun, the seafaring tribe from the Bible, jumped on a boat and um, all the people uh, drowned except for seven men and seven women. And these destitute people struggled up onto the shore. And the Hindus are very hospitable people. They said, here, come and dry yourselves and come and live with us. They said, sorry, we can't. We have to uh, bury our dead. So they went back into the boat and took out the dead people and buried them in two piles, one pile for men and another pile for women. They can show you these piles today in a little village south of in, uh, Bombay. And don't forget, this is a polytheistic country, so there was a bit of a clash here. But the Hindus are so uh, easygoing, tolerant, they said, it's okay, you can keep your religion. And in brief, they lived on the Konkan coast for 2,000 years. Of course, in every country, even though we as Jews said there wasn't intermarriage, obviously there was. I mean, it's quite clear. And so there are dark-skinned Jews and darker-skinned Jews. We can't pretend that, that this is a pure race. So lovely to see you, Auntie Becky. <laughs> Is it? It's been years. Wow. I'm trying to think, would I have recognized you on the street? Not at all. <laughs> not at all. Do I not look like my father? <laughs> not really. Don't, don't flatter yourself. Okay. Jackie, I see you. Good morning. How are you? What are you doing here? Yeah. What? Is this 1976 as well? Yes, that's it. Let me help you. But I don't want to lift. Which one you want? I want to go out. Okay, okay. Up the stairs? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Is it 1976? Yes, that's correct. Yeah, I thought it was different. You know, it's yeah, the same. Nice. You came born with them? Yes, okay. yeah. Okay, see you. You don't Bye. mind going up the stairs? Mine has been a strange life. So I like to think back because it's nothing bad. There was nothing that I said, oh, the only, I have no regrets, really. I'm trying to think, was there any, anything unpleasant? I suppose there were unpleasant things, but I'm not going to tell you about it. My father was self-taught everything. He even taught himself how to play the piano, because having seen the boys give it lessons, he used to sit while they were having lessons, but he wasn't allowed. But he watched and he practiced. He was very good, very good. In fact, he tried to write music. He tried to send music to the publishers. He's tried everything in his time. He, d he doesn't sit back. And company, it was not for him. If you called black, white, and you believed in it, he'd just deliberately be opposite. Deliberately and sort of put up an argument, just to be different. Baghdadi Jews is a more mainstream story. They um, were Iraqi Jews, as the, the, the name implies. I mean, they're not really all from Baghdad. Some are from Basra, some are from Syria. But um, this was a very well-known, very learned community, um, very mainstream. At one time, of course, the Babylonian Talmud um, was the only Talmud, and they were um, the scholars of the Jewish world. And they lived in Iraq for centuries, but in 1846 there was a vicious ruler called Dawid Pasha and um, many of them escaped from this, uh, the pogrom of Dawid Pasha and moved to the east. Hi Eliyahu, good to see you. Smell this. Right. Now, see this picture? This is what came uh, 
uh, on the cover of Amateur Photographer. That's Michel. That's the chap who gave me my job. Oh, look at these. Look at these. That's Monto, Stravinsky. Oh, gosh, what's his name? The famous guitarist, classical guitarist. Uh, Segovia, not. Yeah, Segovia. There's the Firebird. Uh, my father always loved music. And in fact, he played the piano. He used to improvise all the time. He never read from music at all. He just improvised all the time. And he just wanted me to be a Heifetz. Of course, uh, uh, he taught me how to play the violin. He didn't know himself how to do it. He just either read books or watched films. And uh, he just uh, sort of say, there, now play, play it like this, hold the ball like this, hold the violin like this. I was supposed to do it. documentary evidence of Cochin Jews from the 11th century CE. That means Western kind of evidence. There are copper plates from Cochin Jews which were are given by the local ruler who um, bestowed upon the local Jewish leader called Yosef Rabban 72 privileges. The right to ride on an elephant, the right to uh, blow a trumpet, the right to collect taxes from people around, which showed that they had quite a high status, and the right to use a parasol because it was so hot. And 72 of these privileges, as long as the sun and the moon will endure. Don't start questions. Ah, yeah. this is the This is a studio. Oh, yeah, look at that. Studio. I remember that. You know, we went specially to a studio. I remember Paid that. Paid for it. Yes. <laughs> Mama Now, look at, look at that, eh? Macho. Yeah, that's Freddie and yes, me. This is the convent. These are the nuns who taught us. That's Bessie, my best friend. She came to England. You were handsome. That's Eric. I wouldn't have thought so. <laughs> that's beautiful. I wouldn't have thought so. That's you with the twins. Oh, and that's in Malawi. Yeah, it's clothes hanging for drying. <laughs> now here is Essie's wedding. 
Now all your oh, guests, really? <laughs> she was busy taking Real photos, <laughs> and that's Heidi and her husband, oh, Shisha. Shisha, Shisha, Shisha. Yeah. Oh, his, really? His name, you first really name was Moritz, Ma uh, very Moritz and Bertha. Oh, I'm yes, trying to yes, see all yes. the people. Where's Willy? Yeah. Willy's sitting next to you! You were married, that was your wedding party. I'm the Khatam. <laughs> different experiences but my yeah, experience is so so intense and so so in embedded in me it's to this day well I don't know about Essie Essie had a social life I wasn't a social person she always found friends Carmelina Prandi other people you know she oh, had she remembers short, the name she even short I, I remember Carmelina Prandi but because uh, but all the others, you had Dan, uh, Dorothy Diane, and their short-lived friendships. But I, I just watched. <laughs> he was taken to China by his father on a ship. They had hard-boiled eggs. By his uncle, no? By his father. Mm. Okay, we haven't heard this version. Come, no, come, I come. Haven't. Let's, let's hear. Because you didn't sit to listen right. to let's that. Let's hear. Let's hear. I was always sitting with my father. Right. They went to China to his wife's brother the f because he was comfortable. He was the top knot of Edie Sassoon's. He was the boss and he could, and he had two sons and two daughters and you came to England to one of the daughters. Yeah. Yes, I'll tell you that okay, part. Okay. Two sons, two daughters, and he was new. He was, he was just there to have an education that he maintained. They used to have piano lessons, they used to have this and that and the other, and he couldn't take part. He used to sit and watch them and listen and observe. So when they finished practicing and the piano was free, he used to go and play on the piano. And at once they'd come, they'd want to play. So he had to back off. So he had a very hard childhood. And as soon as he finished his Oxford Cambridge, he had marvelous results. His certificate was still in the drawer. And the uncle said, now you have to work. He so wanted to become a doctor or some profession that was out. So he went to work. And as soon as he could afford it, he moved into a room and manage himself. Where in, was this? In China, still in China. Shanghai, yes? Yeah. And the first, and he saved, he saved so hard. He bought himself a piano, he taught himself and to play. I can't tell you, he struggled, but he loved what he did. And I think you've got a bit of him, but he had. I wish I had a little yeah, bit of him. I know, know. What are I you know. About he, was, he was marvelous. I had nothing of him. Yeah, but he took himself to America and from then on, I don't know because I know he ended up in California. And he must have had a fairly good bachelor time, you know, he must have enjoyed it. And the next thing he knows, he was on a ship to, Bo uh, to Bombay. <laughs> he comes to Bombay and his pair, my pa uh, mother was Baghdadian. His parents were from Cochin, and the father and mother didn't live together. The Sardans belong to the Cochin um, community. They're part of the story of the Paradesi community, of the foreigner community. In other words, they weren't indigenous Malabar Jews. In fact, they weren't indigenous uh, Indian Jews at all. And we certainly have documentation of a very wealthy uh, Cochin, uh, a Turkish Jew who arrived in Calicut, which was one of the major port areas near Kerala, where they were trading in pepper and so on. He was extremely wealthy and um, he had two wives and ten children from the two wives, a big trader, and he was an um, intermediary with uh, some of the important 
uh, rulers, local rulers, most of whom were, of course, Muslim. He was a translator. He didn't know English, but he knew Portuguese. And he knew, of course, Arabic, and he knew Hebrew, and he knew many languages. And he was uh, quite a big shot in the 18th century. He came to Bombay, and he, he wasn't a shul goer, and it was Yom Kippur. And he went to this Balkala synagogue. And he's not a religious person. He must have gone in late. And the first person to come out of the synagogue, I don't know, I suppose interval time, was my mother. Well, he pursued her and pursued. She was only 17, she was still in college, studying to be a teacher, the same college that I was. Really? Yes. How she knows all this? Because it was the only college there. The nuns were the only people who educated. You had your violin lessons and you were home. So, I went to school, my darling. Yes, and it was interrupted with your uh, career, your violin. You know, you know how they used to sneak out with the nun's permission to get, because Mrs. Crown made trouble for you. Let's hear the story of Mum now. She, she's yeah. interrupting. She met, yeah, go on. I can tell you every detail. It's amazing, absolutely amazing. So he pursued her and pursued her. And the Parents, her parents have none of it. Baghdadian or nothing else. Anyway, she married against her parents' wish. She never forgot it, never forget. And they had a few years of happy marriage. Auntie Regina used to come to my grandfather. Her who's father. her father. And says, I don't know. This husband of mine, I don't know what to do. He says, get out of here. You, you married him. I told you not to. You married him. Now live with it. I don't want to hear any more from you. We used to, as children, stand there and listen to this. <laughs> he threw her out of the house every time she came complaining. He became religious because of my mother. Because she would only have a religious man. Oh, and he, he kept the religion he to... He knew. He knew all about He knew everything. God. He was very clever. I wish she passed on some of it yeah, to me. Yeah. No, but he didn't. He didn't want to know. She was the one who forced us to learn. He could rattle off any. Yeah, yeah he could. And talk he about learned it from his that. grandfather. The, he what? what put learned. him off religion. He, we, he used to go to synagogue all the time. What put him off was, and we were sitting next to uh, his wife, uh, my mother's um, <coughs> brother. brother, and the whole family. We always sit again but they were always chatting about business in synagogue, and he didn't like that. So he gave it up. When I went to um, uh, their home, I met up with Uncle Ellis. He was always, but always by his uh, radio, which is a big contraption that he had built himself from scratch. And he called it Rebellis. Rebellis, Rebecca and Ellis. And he was always playing with it. And he would scream if the people upstairs were using a fan that was uh, creating sparks and causing a disturbance on his uh, radio. And the first time he was able to get BBC, he was so excited. He was an interesting character. He was a lawyer, He'd go to work in the morning, come back in the evening. They used to have a courtroom where the... All these solicitors used so, to meet, yeah, like a right, common room. Advocate. He was an advocate. advocate. Uh, they sat over there and they used to... Uh, people who needed a, an advocate to face uh, 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 the judge came into this room and sort of asked for, for a lawyer. And many people had what they called touts. They paid people who got the people from outside do you need a lawyer? I'll find one for you. And they were bribed, like paid, special, you know, to find a lawyer for them. So they'd go to the the lawyers who paid them, oh, who paid them to yes. recommend, to be recommended. My father refused to pay about, anybody. How, how do you know all So this? if somebody came in, all well and good, and picked him out, all well and good. And that's how he made a living, which wasn't much. 
He used to get the poor class. He, exactly. Anybody who couldn't afford, he took on. Auntie Regina was a nurse, and during the war, penicillin had suddenly turned up for the public because they'd been, when it first came out, they were using it for the troops. Then when it came out for the public, they had, um, uh, they only had the crystalline form, which you had to inject every four hours. So Auntie Regina was onto a good thing because she'd have to visit people's homes every four hours to give them an injection. She got her patients or clients from doctors. All the top doctors in Bombay somehow knew about her caring for patients and they used to engage her whenever people needed caring. And she was booked practically every day through the year with different patients. And she used to even sometimes stay with them all night. Mm. She used to care with them. She was a very good carer. Now, how did that come about, do you know? How did that come about? How I did it know. come about? Horesh? As children, she left us to go and look after the people, Florence's mother, Diana's mother, all the women who needed attention. She was in their house for nothing because she was doing, she wanted to get out of the house. She hated the home. So she found all these places where she could be of use and I friendship she, she got. Hated it. I think she liked um, she helping will, people. She left the house. She, she was never at home. That's right. Do you remember? Yeah, yeah. So where did she go? She, she went to after. Florence's house, all these welcoming houses where the women stayed at home. They stayed at home. They had servants and she stayed over there socializing and helping. And according to her, she had lucky hands. She was born with a cowl, so they said, so she said, and a she veil. had lucky a hands. Veil. Skin veil, yeah. And she had lucky hands. Wherever she went, whatever she touched, people got better. That was that the I theory. Remember, yeah. We were children, and we had a little sister, Katie. We were in a room and the servants were busy in the kitchen, nattering with boyfriends. My mother's always out. And she decided, and she was always collecting clothes for washing. She decided she collected clothes and then suddenly the clothes were left. I was little, but in how I remember pile. this, in a pile. pile. She climbed up on a stool and went on to uh, the chest of drawers. Then started investigating in the drawers, she saw a matchbox. So she was, she lit a match and she saw a flame and she dropped it. It dropped onto the pile of clothes. Well, that was it. And I was standing outside and all I remember is the child walking towards the fire. And I ran to the kitchen, Mari, Mari, Mari. Of course, they didn't answer quick enough. And they came to this fire and the child was, and of course, I hate to think what happened after that because from that day on, we didn't have servants. My father stayed at home. He lost the best. He loved that little child. He kept the dress till the day, you know, and I saw it in the drawer and I wanted to keep it and it disappeared. I can't, I was going to take that green dress. He had it in Bombay in his cupboard. In Bombay, we were observant after a fashion. It was, I don't know to what extent, we were religious, but uh, we, uh, it was much more a social thing to be uh, Jewish there, as far as I, 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 I was concerned, as far as I could see. <laughs> uh, what? <laughs> what? what? Hebrew <laughs> lessons from... <laughs> That's a good one, it's a good yeah, one. Very good question. <laughs> Ducky, <laughs> come on. You, you no, say I it. want to hear no, your no, version. You I say, got my you, version. You Pat. say it with a distinction. Come on. No, 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 no. You, you give your version. I give you my version. And my version is correct. I'm All right, then let's hear no. it. No, let's hear it. I want your version. Oh, no. My version is only that uh, he used to, every time we got it wrong, he used to beat us and we couldn't stand who, it anymore. Who was it who beat you? Uh, 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 what do you call uh, a Jewish. Uh, uh, 
So you haven't got it. You, what did you remember? She employed a Jewish fellow to teach us how to read. One Jewish fellow? Well, that's the only yeah, thing I yeah, remember. That's, yeah, I can only remember one. Why? You can remember one. We had a series of teachers whom she might have found who were willing to give us a lesson. I'll never forget. They either find, uh, they had some uh, hobby which they brought along with them. And the knowledge that I have in Hebrew was exactly what my mother gave me, the Aleph base. Apart from that, these teachers taught us nothing. They came, they took the money and taught nothing. There was a fellow from Bicolor and yeah, they were very right. short-lived. Yeah. The Shema, my mother taught us, that stayed. Well, it's not very pleasant. <laughs> no. The most memorable was waking up at seven o'clock in the morning. My father used to... Uh... Move on. <laughs> Becky, you tell it. No. Very bad life. Very hard life. He the worst. He got the worst. Anyway, he started me on the violin. And no breakfast, no lunch, no dinner, till one o'clock at night. I don't, I don't know why I'm crying because I've never, you were, you were I've never, never, never bothered with it before. He blotted it out. And I, everything, every time I played something wrong, of course, I would get a little whack on the leg. God. But, uh, but I remember not having anything to eat till, till one o'clock in the morning. That was my uh, worst day in my here. life. You were in England. I don't know why I'm crying. I've never I, thought I'm about it. I'm with you because I saw it all. Eric, poor fellow. Becky was her father's favorite. But Becky used to come with with uh, bruises on her arm. Becky did? Becky. And I said, Becky, what's this? So uh, she says, oh, my father beat me. Becky? Why? Why? In my memory her, was he never beat Becky. Her father adored her, but I don't know what happened. best times were Shabbat afternoon lunch oh, in my is. mother's uh, brother's house mm. and oh it was really lovely mm. Hameen, uh, uh, chutney and the curries. Aya was a good cook. Oh she was a marvellous cook and uh, she was so good that she stayed right till the end yes. of uh, uh, our cousin's life. Dana. All the way through. Freddie. Freddie. Yes. We love going to that house. The only yes. house. When I was a teenager, I joined uh, the Maccabee Club and I liked it because it was, they had the sports and uh, um, social life, social life, and meeting people, and they. But mainly because they, we could um, do gym with 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 a qualified person. <whistles> the Maccabi whistle. That's the Maccabi whistle. A person who lived right at the end of the road, but it's a long road. Okay, he, she, uh, he or she walked to the next house. And he came down, and then the two of them went pipe, to the pipe. next house, and the pipe pipe, <laughs> until we all uh, got a group and went to the club, the Maccabi Club. That was our uh, Jewish social life. Maccabi booked a swimming pool for one hour, four nights. And uh, we would swim, we would play water polo, and uh, there were water polo tournaments, so we took part in those. The third Maccabiah, which was the first after Israel was created, 
was in 1950. And we got a lot of experience in playing others because all we did was play the same two or three teams in Bombay. We never even left Bombay to play water polo. And we came back, we trounced every other team. So because we uh, trounced everybody else, they were more or less compelled to take at least two of us from our team to the Olympic Games. So two of us, another classmate of mine, we were both in medical school at the time, and I went to uh, the Olympic Games. The most famous member of the Sagan family is Michael Sagan, who uh, was an employee of the uh, London Society for the Christianity Amongst the Jews, and he converted to Christianity. And he was actually the first missionary of the London Society uh, to work amongst the Jews and try and um, convert them to Christianity in India. Now we're talking of 1820s. Um, he converted and was baptized in 1818. Although this saga was very well thought of by the London Society, he had hardly any success whatsoever. Uh, in the official documentation, he apparently managed to convert one person and two other women, They're probably his wife. And I wonder whether the one person was his brother. She was a very good violinist, and she won a scholarship to England. Uh, yeah. Full, full scholarship. Eastern, the, the whole for East, up the, the whole East. Yeah, for, for five years, scholarship. But it was the war, yeah, and she, so she had to wait. Yes, yeah, no, wait. She went no, on a no, troop ship. But why, when the war was over? No. She didn't go during the war. On a she troop came for the... ship, she yes. went. There was bombing in England. What are no, you talking not, about? No, she no, went not the big that. case. Ah. And if, if you get the year she came here, you'll know it was the end of the war. Right. Towards, what year? What year? The... Now let's have the squalid let... that they were, they were interested to film. Come on, what year did she come? I don't know. It was towards the end. Five years before. I was here 48. Five years before 48. Seven, six, five, four, three. 1943 was right in the middle of uh, middle. the war. And she was through the bombing and the doodle bugs and all that. That's right. Yes. What wow. are you talking about? Yeah, yeah, you're right. So she came, she was so brave. All my shackles <laughs> fell, fell apart. I was on my own. I could do what I liked. That was fantastic. I, I went horse riding, I, I did things I wanted to do, didn't have to ask anybody. Travelled a lot. And I travelled, I went to, um, to Norway and saw the fjords and then Ireland. I went to an island and then I... <laughs> we heard about all these travels and she had no money. She was always asking for funds. <laughs> I just travelled all over Europe. And where did you get the money from? <laughs> from home. Mm -hmm. Yeah, crying, crying that you you couldn't live. That's right. <laughs> so we felt sorry for her. I had to get out of the convent. I know. I, I couldn't know. stay there. Yeah, I know. In I the know. holiday period, I had to get out. Yeah, but she was very brave. Something I admire. I couldn't do it, and I don't regret it. What the hell is going on? I don't know, sir. The agent got a telegram, and it just said he is coming. And gave the time of the train. Who the hell is he? 100,000 Englishmen simply cannot control 350 million Indians if those Indians refuse to cooperate. Where did the Jewish community stand vis-a-vis -vis independence? That's connected to their um, attitude to the British. So the Baghdadis, who had identified with the Jews, went to their clubs, I mentioned, had no alternative but to leave. They had to plan their departure. They weren't Indians. They didn't look Indian. They wouldn't be accepted in a new Indian uh, country or government, they felt. Uh, so uh, many of them planned to leave. And they went, a lot went to Britain. And many went to Los Angeles and Australia. Now, the Venezuelans were in an interesting position. They were 
Indian and Indian looking and wore saris and bangles and all that. And but they'd been in the British Army in the British um, employ uh, in trains and telegraphs they used to work. And so um, they were attracted by the new Jewish state, which was declared a year later after independence. But they took their time coming to Israel because they had various problems in Israel, uh, amongst them not necessarily being accepted as full Jews. And the Cochin Jews were fervently Zionistic. They decided to sell their property and go on Aliyah. But the Paradesi stayed behind. They had lots of property in India and they felt very ambivalent. So some came and some didn't. Uh, 1948, I came here when she finished. She finished her studies and because she was in college, I was able to get her into college at the last minute. I arrived in August when, um, when what do you call the, uh, um, uh, exams for entry, entry exams had closed. But because of her, uh, her relationship, they, they agreed to give me an interview uh, alone, special interview. So when I played for them, they accepted me on one condition that I take, I was a violinist. They accepted me on one condition that I took up the viola. They were very short of viola players and good ones, if that. So they said, after a year, I would have to take that up as a first subject and give up the violin, which I, um, I kind of accepted, and I never looked back. I didn't touch the violin again. I can't remember the year. It must be... It was for her wedding. I brought her oh, wedding right. outfit, which that's she right. designed and ordered to be made in Bombay. So I brought her... A oh, truth, not right. a truth. I forgot that. Yeah, mm. yeah. I lost my job. No, you didn't. She got a very good job, teaching I lost, job. Yeah, but just a minute. Before I got the good job, I was in a council school doing a job. And I was, the DMOPs took my place, and I had to look again through the Jewish Chronicle. And I found this uh, gold is green one. Yeah, you yeah. found a good job. Yeah, and that stayed in for the rest of my Oh, that was in a Jewish school, yes? Yeah, of course. I, I remember even the interview with Mr. Sh uh, Rabbi Munk. Very, you know, mm. <coughs> wow. No Jewish education, no this thing, no Jewish And he's looking at me. I didn't know even, apart from the Shema, I knew nothing. <laughs> he employed me. <laughs> <laughs> but you must know about Essie. She was a very good violinist, right? She got a teacher's degree in violence, GRSM. And what does she do? She goes to a college for six months to get a degree in secular subjects. And instead of teaching violin and playing violin, she became a headmistress in a school. The teaching, I loved teaching. I was quite a strict te teacher and the, and the children got on very well. And they had 11 plus exams, and they did very well in these exams. Um, and then the, the 11 plus was finished. Uh, I still taught there. And um, I mean, I only did well because I was st a strict teacher. That's all. I think it was a natural movement once Essie came here. Eric came, then uh, he said, you know, the rest should come along. I couldn't cope and I had to work because we couldn't survive on just really earning a living. But they planned to come anywhere. They had twins to look after. My mother couldn't have been happier. She did all the shopping in Ridley Road Market. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she was very happy. And my father was content. Yeah. He, my father worked a bit. He worked a bit yeah, and he couldn't he stand worked. it. <laughs> Willie had a cousin called Bart Felt and he lived in Bishop's Avenue, which is a very fancy road in London. And he, one day, one evening, we invited him for tea and, you know, because he was a cousin, so we invited him. And then he sat there and tells Willie, how long do you intend to live like this in this flat? 
So he says, until I can afford to move. So he says, all right, I'll give you the money and you can pay me back in installments. But she doesn't tell you the true finish of the story, how we got involved. I'll never forget it because I was, I was, I felt very strongly about it. They did this all secretly and they were moving in the assumption that the landlord would keep us on. And the, I landlord didn't said, the landlord said, you move, they move. Now panic started. My father had to find a place. What can we afford? We can't afford anything. So he went to all the little Stamford Hill, all the little things, pokey places to look because Eric and I were working, we had no time. Do you remember that? I don't we remember. We had to, of course you wouldn't remember because you were in the lap of luxury. You, you had a home, you had to go. I mean, we were left holding. Yeah. And what, what, uh, what knowledge have, has my father got who had just come from India? What, he was working. Uh, I was with, with and the BBC. And he was in Leeds. You were in Leeds. I'll tell you the luck of BBC. He was in Leeds oh, and I was here. No. Yes. I and I got that. a job. But when luck, you all were still in Manor House, when I got the it job. It is God's work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, I got he the was the source. He got a job in the BBC from... So he started nego you know, looking around. And we were, my father went to agents, house agents, and they took us here, they took us... I said, I'm not having any of that. I don't oh, want... Oh, yes, you're the one. You saw it from outside. I no, don't want to know. not this one. He not says, that Tom, one. Without and going in, she said, no, not And this. he said, come Becky, I'll show you. I'll never forget it. We walked down and I said, I'll have any house on this road, Mallard Way, and it was number 16. It was him who found it. And we had it and it was an old couple and they couldn't wait to move out. They said it brought them bad luck. My mother said it gave us good luck and that's exactly what it did. Tell me a little bit about the uh, the circumstances of Dada's passing. Oh, um, well, the, the last, oh, what can I tell you? Oh, yes, yes, I think the, it started when he f fell down from the stool. He was climbing to do something, and he fell down. And that was the start of his going downhill. He was in the hospital for a little while, and he got pneumonia, and... And Nana and Dad are buried in the same yeah. place? Yeah, uh, one on top of the other. I'll be on top of Florence. It's also one on top of the other. And mainly because there's no... There's no, they want to save space in the cemetery. Go on, Essie, you're the eldest, you start. My legacy to my grandchildren would be they have to know that they can only succeed with hard work because that's how I succeeded. Well, I would say that they should be caring and understanding of other people. Thank God, my children. I'm satisfied with them. I love them. And they've got the qualities I admire in them. And I don't know from where they got it. May it carry on. May it carry on. <laughs>